Thank you for listening to my podcast. Like my page on Facebook for daily inspirational quotes with pictures from Indian country and for other podcast interviews with successful native or indigenous people. This podcast episode is brought to you by Northern Edge Casino. Check out Northern Edge Casino and their upcoming concert with Tracy Lawrence. Tickets can be bought for $25 for general admission or $35 for VIP access to the front rows. Enjoy this podcast episode. Hello, listeners. Thank you for joining me on 21st Century Native Leaders. My name is Peter Desert III, and I'm here with Mr. Sean Martin. Sean is a high school administrator, coach, and professional ultra marathoner. Thanks for being on the show, Sean. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, your tribal affiliation, and where you come from. I grew up in a, in a place called Fachi in, in Arizona, just south of Page. Uh, so I'm Navajo. Uh, my mother is German. Uh, uh, so I grew up in a little place called Fachi. Most people know Antelope Canyon <laughs> nowadays. And uh, I went to school in, at NAU, ran on a, on a running scholarship at NAU. Uh, Go Jacks, two-time national champions his last two years. Pretty awesome team they're, they're creating over there. And then uh, I came here to Chin Lee. Uh, my wife is from here in Chin Lee. We began teaching and coaching here. Uh, and we have two kids here uh, in Chin Lee. Oh, that's awesome. <clears throat> so uh, you kind of talked a little bit about your running career. At what age did you start running? And, and talk with me a little bit about that, your high school career, maybe junior high career. Sure. Uh, I, I honestly don't even remember when I started running. Um, only because my, my father is a pretty traditional guy, and uh, he, he used to get us up pretty early in the morning <clears throat> and uh, get us out running at, at sunrise. Um, and so I started competing. I think my first race was on my fourth birthday. It was actually the day of my birth. My, my dad loaded my brothers and I up and took us into to Page for the Memorial Day 5K race. And so that was my first race on my actual fourth birthday. And uh, we learned that we could win some stuff. You know, we got awards and stuff. And so we started competing. Got to uh, Junior Olympics uh, in elementary school. Going into middle school, we were running really well. <clears throat> and then in, in high school, um, won a couple state titles there and, and earned a, a, scholar, a scholarship to go to NAU. Um, but, uh, yeah, we ran. Uh, um, we had some really awesome teams in, in middle school and in high school. Under uh, Coach Lomlin, Mark Lomlin, and, and Jim Trapp. And then uh, was blessed to be a part of Coach Ron Mann's team, who just got inducted into the National Track and Field Hall of Fame. Wow, that's awesome. That's a pretty amazing career that you've had. So uh, talk with me about how you got into coaching cross-country and possibly track as well. Yeah, so when I was, <laughs> when I was in elementary school, I was a crazy little guy. Um, had problems in the classroom and it wasn't learning related it was discipline related in the classroom um and when i got to the sixth grade coach mark lomland was the one who actually said hey you got to straighten up at school if you keep acting this way you're not going to be able to travel and race this weekend and so he uh he came like he became kind of a second father to me you know he guided me through my running career and because we spent so much time together, um, I naturally just wanted to become a teacher and a coach just like him. And so that's how I went down the career path of, of becoming an educator and, uh, and a coach. Wow, that's so interesting. That's very similar to me. I uh, used to get in trouble a lot, get in fights. <laughs> and uh, in seventh grade, a coach, a football coach said, hey, Des, you should come play football. And I started playing football. And Stay out of trouble. Grades came up. Played football yeah. in college for two years. So very similar uh, story. Oh, nice. 
So uh, tell me about why you advocate for running and promoting health. Well, beyond uh, just being a large part of Navajo culture uh, and the te teachings that running provides us, you know, traditionally, I was told, I was taught when I was a child that, uh, you know, running is, is a couple things to, to net people. It's first a celebration of life. It's second, a, a form of prayer. And finally, it's a, it's a, it's a teacher. It's a mentor. Running can teach us how to overcome obstacles in life. So aside from the traditional beliefs and values of, of distance running, I firmly believe that the act of running itself is, is, is something that can become medicine uh, and is medicine for whatever may be ailing an individual. And, uh, you know, pursuing the, the, the coaching career has only been able to allow our youth, our native youth, who were like me, uh, crazy little kids in school who could have easily gone down the wrong path. Uh, it's provided these individuals the right path to go down and has bettered their lives. So it's been a blessing to be associated to, to, the, to the world of running and uh, with our kids here in, in Chinle. Wow, that's pretty powerful. I like the way you connect that. Whenever you said that, the first thing it reminded me of is Whenever uh, my sister or my cousins would, you know, had their kinalta, their puberty yeah. ceremony, and you know, you get up and you run and you yell and you run to the east. So that's about you. Once you said that, that's in my head. That's what I immediately thought about. So tell me about the movie you're featured in, Thirty One Hundred Run to Become. Thirty One Hundred Run to Become was uh, just a, an awesome project to be a part of. Uh, the director, Sanjay Rao, just contacted me and said, hey, um, we've read a little bit about you. We, we'd really like to come out and meet you and see if you're a good fit for this film. Um, it came out and he explained what, what, was, what was being created. And I thought it aligned directly to what I just explained, that, that cultural and spiritual side of, of running. Um, you know, in the world of ultra marathoning, I enjoy it because... It's, uh, it's competitive, and, and it's a race, uh, but when you're running 50 to 100 miles, um, there's also a spiritual component. You, you, you connect to those natural things, those natural forces. Uh, in Navajo, we say, the holy ones that are out there at dawn. You know, they came out and um, followed me around for... For a couple uh, months, almost a, a two-year process, actually on and off, and um, they wanted to capture something that was was uh, culturally significant, ru a run wire, a run that was culturally significant. And so, uh, I told them I'd always wanted to retrace my father's footsteps from uh, his boarding school days. He used to run away from Loop Boarding School all the way back over to the family's original homestead in Ottawa. Uh, about 80 some 87 miles is what I guessed it to be and so um, he thought that would be great so um, uh, we took off one winter morning and uh, he changed the route a little bit to uh, make it a little bit more cinematic but uh, it was a really good run uh, it ended up being just over a hundred miles it was uh, mid-December about five degrees and we took off and he captured some really really good shots Wow, that's amazing. And when is that uh, documentary supposed to be released? It's out. Oh, it's, it's out? out? Okay. Yeah, it, it played in Flag Flagstaff for about two weeks. It was in uh, Santa Fe. It's down in Tucson. I believe they just started playing it up in Denver and, and, and that area. Um, but their website, 3100film.com, has, has the whole schedule on there right now. Oh, wow. So are they going to uh, show it around the uh, reservation? or? Yeah, they've, they've started talking with different theaters, the one in, in Winter Rock, the one in Tuba City, um, I think the one in Kianta. Um, so they want to they wanna show it at the, the local theaters. But beyond that, they also want to come to the high school here in Chin Lee and do a free showing for anyone who'd like to come which I think would be a great thing to do um, to invite all the local high school teams, middle school teams, and, and just have a big free community event. 
wow, that'd be amazing to see. So, uh, you know, you talked about some of the components of running, but, you know, for your training, how important is a diet to your ultra marathon running? <laughs> it's funny, uh, that question comes up quite a bit. Um, diet is, is enormous. Um, and, you know, you got, you got to think of food as fuel. And you, you, so you got to be putting clean fuel into your body. Uh, to set up your training runs and, and, and your daily life. But on the flip side of that, it's kind of funny because you go to any given ultra marathon and at the aid stations are the most horrible junk foods you can imagine. Uh, and it's just people looking for that quick sugar during a race. You know, you're 70 miles in and your body's falling apart and you need just fast sugars. But as far as training and as far as uh, living a healthy lifestyle, the, the diet is an enormous part. And you do you do notice if you're uh, if you live if you're starting to eat some uh, a diet that's imbalanced you, you feel it in your training those long runs are more difficult to finish and when you clean up your diet it allows you to run a little bit more efficiently. That's amazing. So this that last question kind of parallels to this one. How do you avoid overtraining and injuries? So that's kind of the the runner's conundrum, right? Like you want to train and you want to train effectively, but we want to reduce the amount of injuries. And so um, for me, it's taken a lifetime of just learning to listen to my body. Um, so, you know, I, I just came down with this bug, uh, this little sickness that I have right now. Um, and it's funny, on, on Monday I came home from work and I went for my evening run. And I just felt horrible. I'd only gone six or seven miles, and I felt horrible the whole time. And I, I knew my body. I knew something was coming up. I knew there was something internally going on. And sure enough, Tuesday morning, I woke up with just this flu that I have. Uh, but the same thing applies to the actual training. You know, if you're listening to your body and it's telling you there's there's tightness here and there's aches and pains there. You got to take care of those before you can move on in your training, um, and then just knowing when your body is 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 stressed enough to to be able to tone it back a little bit and and keep those injuries from coming on. Wow, that's powerful. Those are good ideas and and some things to think about. What about the mental aspect? Whenever you're out on a 70, 80, 90 mile run, <laughs> that's the fun part because you can. You can lose yourself in, in the mileage, you know, um, I try, I, most of the time I don't run with a watch just because when you do and you have it set up for mile, mile splits, you're watching your watch, you're looking at the mileage on there rather than just running. Um, and that can make a, a, a long run go very, very long. Um, and so for me, I, I try to not run with a watch. Um, it, it just allows you to get inside your own your own head and, and your your own yourself and think about oh everything. I mean, in, in a in a ten mile run, you can think about the whole last week and the whole next week, and then you know, the miles just kind of tick by. Um, but for me, in the lit in the in the really long runs, um, I I kind of just mentally almost tune out but at the same time tune in to my body and to the surroundings so it's a it's a really fun space to be in mentally when you forget about all the things going on in the world um and in your daily lives and you're able to reflect in internally and then really connect to the land um it's it's a fun experience oh that's amazing so what are the similarities you see between running and life uh, oh, this is a good one. Uh, we just had our home cross-country meet here last weekend, uh, the Canyon de Chez Invitational. And that was one of the things that we were talking about with the younger middle school, junior high level kids. Um, you know, th the, the difficulties that you experience as a person, as a human being, as a student, as a professional, um, are kind of reflective on, uh, onto the cross-country course or onto a route that you may be running. All of the hills, the sand, the, uh, we had a water pit at our home meet. Uh, you never know what's around the next turn. And by training as a runner 
and, and preparing yourself for life as a student, um, it, uh, they, they parallel themselves very closely. And so the, the hardships that a person may go through in, in life can be re reflected in the hardships that one feels as a runner. And the mentality is that positive self-talk to overcome those hardships. You know, in a, in a given race, there's always a certain point where your, your mind is telling you to slow down, to stop, to walk. It's too hot. It's, it hurts too much. Your body hurts too much. Um, and it's your mindset that, that gets you through those struggles because the body is, is, is capable of some amazing things. To be able to control your mind and push your body, I think, is the essence of becoming a, a, a runner. Uh, but beyond that, to be able to commit to the spiritual side of things is, uh, is bringing in the wellness, the, the, whole, the holisticness of, a, of being a human and then being a runner. Nice. I like the way you stated that. So when you are coaching, do you feel you, you are teaching life skills with your athletes? Oh, most definitely. By, um, by, by being a cross-country and, and track and field coach, you're constantly teaching skills, life skills, rather than just running. At, at any given practice, uh, I think we talk more about uh, being a good person and doing things right rather than the specifics of what they should be getting out of that workout because during a workout it's painful you know it's 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 uh it, it hurts you're, you're pushing your body and so to relieve that you have to talk about positive things and make fun and have a good time and and find enjoyment in in practice and then when you're on those long runs with, with individuals, you're not talking about uh, what they should be getting out of the long run. You're talking more about their grades, their home life, how they're going to be able to pursue their goals in life. So you most definitely teach more life skills than anything else as, as a running coach. Nice. And what percent of your job do you think is motivating your students, student athletes? I'd, I'd say most of it. Um, uh, quite honestly, I'd say 98%, you know, even though the paperwork takes up a lot of the other time, um, most of my job is to motivate young people to become better individuals um, through schools, through athletics, um, and then just to be there for them when, when, when they're in need, um, to support them and, and help them see goals that uh, they may have not previously identified as, as goals, as opportunities. Right, that's amazing. That's similar. I, I've coached middle school and high school <coughs> track and football, and I think that's a, a, a huge percentage, always motivating students to, to push yeah. themselves, and you know, the life skills are, are extremely important. So what type of training do you have uh, your students do in the off-season? Oh, the off-season training is the fun stuff because that's when uh, the pressure is off. There's no racing, no real racing to be done. Um, and so a lot of the off-season is just running and becoming more efficient as a runner. And then the core work, you know, building your, your hip flexors and core stability, um, our posterior chains, you know, from our calves and gastrocnemius to the hamstrings and, and back. Uh, a, a lot of us are just really weak in our posterior chain these days. So um, summertime is the fun time where the relationships are built and the long runs happen and the strength training happens. And uh, you become a family with, with the team. You know, they're out there and, and putting in the miles. As, as long as they do, they really become a, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, a, a little secondary family. And that's what makes strong, strong teams strong, is uh, all of that time they spend in the summer running together and building together. That's amazing. So I think you kind of answered this one, but what are the keys to building a winning cross-country program? I know a few years ago my wife watched a documentary about you and your cross-country team. So uh, talk to me a little bit about them. So building a cross-country, a successful team or program, really comes down to one thing um 
and it's showing uh, on the coaching side. It's it comes down to showing the students that you care about them. That's it. As human beings, um, once you you capture a kid's heart, once you show a child that you're truly there for their their good, their betterment, our our kids just they flock to you and and they'll work like you'd never imagined students working before. You know, they'll they'll commit at the highest levels. And that's really what it truly boils down to. Um, but when it comes to the building blocks of a successful program, you, you obviously need, uh, you need kids who are willing to work. Uh, but taking a step back, you only get the kids that are willing to work um, if you show them that you care about them. And the funniest thing happens when you do, you know, and you can do that in, in many different ways. I enjoyed just having a, a Saturday long run and afterwards having a meal with them. You know, when you cook for a kid, they, they just think that you're the best guy ever. And a simple meal, you'll get a, a, a great little family atmosphere going and uh, the team starts to build and build. Another component is the traditions that the team forms. Our very first run of the year, we call it the mud run. And, uh, you know, traditionally, if, if, uh, most, if there's an issue with most schools and most programs, um, it's the first day of practice. Not everyone comes out on the first day, and they drag their feet coming out. Well, here we did a mud run on the first day, and no one wanted to miss the run, mud run because we just literally ran down into the wash and just ran through the, the muddy wash for the first day of practice. The mothers out there probably hated it because the kids would come home muddy every year <laughs> on the first day of practice. But uh, no one missed the first day of, of practice because it was a fun day and they all wanted to be there. So those those little traditions that a team builds through a year and then those traditions are carried on year after year after year. And after the accumulation of these of these traditions, no one wants to drop the tradition. No one wants to be... The person who is at fault fault for messing up their tradition, and so uh, they 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 kind of keep building, and the performances only grow and grow and grow. So if I, I said it was two different things, it would be um, showing kids you care about them, building that family component, and then uh, building some traditions that the the program can be proud of. Wow, that's powerful. I like that. So um, to switching gears a little bit. How important is your Navajo culture? Uh, I think Navajo culture is the foundation of everything we do and the way we think. Um, you know, personally, uh, we we practice the traditional beliefs, and with my children, I want them to have that grounding in culture as they are growing and go out into the world to pursue their passions. And so with the same core concepts that I have here in my own home with my own wife and children, um, I translate that into my workplace. You know, I think that when I talk about our kids, I'm, I'm talking about my children, but I'm also talking about our community's children in the same exact component, in the same exact aspect. Um, I want for our, the, the children of our community the same thing I want for my own kids. And so a lot of that is rooted in traditional beliefs and practices. And, um, you know, the, the, from the fundamental way we think and plan and act and reflect um, is rooted in, in, those, in their philosophies. Wow, that's powerful. So how do you balance uh, your Navajo culture in the modern world? Um, I, that's, that's a fun one because uh, in the modern world, we can be distracted in so many different ways. Uh, but to, to keep that balance of traditional practice and beliefs in, in the modern world, um, you have to make time. You have to make time to practice those things, like getting up and running in the morning for traditional reasons, uh, to, to, to pray and to speak to the holy people. Um, so making time is one. Um, and then the other is is making it a priority. If, if, if it's not a priority with all the distractions in today's world, um, we would easily be led maybe a different direction. 
uh, but making time for it and making a prior making it a priority is is key in, in maintaining that balance. Um, simple little thing we do every night. We in in that model of of thinking and, and planning and acting and reflecting. Every night at our dinner table, we turn everything off and we sit down and we have our family dinner. And in that reflection area, we talk about one good thing that happened that day with the family. You know, my kids share something that happened good every day mm -hmm. we have a meal. And if I may be on travel or my wife is on travel or something like that, we still sit down and, and uh, either FaceTime and we use the modern technology that we have today to allow us to practice those traditional beliefs. So there's, there's benefits to it too. Right. That's awesome. I like that. Is there anything else you would like to share uh, with the audience? Uh, not, not a whole lot. Um, just thank you for having me on. And uh, if they can check out the 3100 film and, and see what it's all about and, it's a really humanistic story that shows that we are one. We are one people worldwide, and uh, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a film that needs to be shared right now, given the current status of humanity and with where the Earth is right now. I mean, I just saw on, on the news we had nine different hurricanes going on ar around the world. And, I think as people, we need to come together to take care of our earth because it's the only one we got. That's true. I like the way you said that was eloquently stated. Um, I also, I noticed uh, you have a weekly uh, show for uh, Chinley Athletics. You want to talk a little bit about that? Maybe people can tune into <laughs> your show. Yeah, so it's, um, it, it's just something I started this year to kind of bring, to communicate to our, our, our Wildcat fans uh, more efficiently. Um, you know how it is on social media, you're, yeah. you're scrolling through and, and you see a lot of writing, but when you see a video, you're more add up to stop and watch it. And so it's not really a weekly show, it's just kind of whenever we I can sit a coach down and talk about the game or the season, but uh, it's called Coach's Corner, and um, I sit down with a coach and talk about you know their game or their practice or where they're at in the season, mm -hmm. and it's a good way to communicate to, to fans and parents and, and people of the community to get the word out on, with what uh, each team is doing. Wow, I like that. I know in uh, my high school, we kind of focus on communicating with stakeholders, and I think that's a really good way to communicate um, what's going on in your school with the uh, community and, and I guess parents and families and people that follow your program. I like the way you do that. Um, so we are all set. Um, if you could send me a, a background image for the back of the podcast, that way people can put um, an image to your voice. That'd be great. And if it's if someone else took the picture, just uh, let me know. That way I can give the photo credit to uh, the person that took the photo. All right. Yeah, that's no problem. Sound good. So, yeah, you, can you text me the the link to the podcast or whatever when it comes out? Absolutely. I'll um I'll share the uh, the link uh, with you, and then uh, that way you can you know share it. And I I usually have about um, three thousand to four thousand people listen to each episode. Wow. It's, yeah, especially the ones where there is a lot of you know the running. I, you know that's a big thing. I feel in our native communities. Mm -hmm. Um. For example, for example, I uh, interviewed Al Elvina um, okay. Begay, and she went to NAU too. And yep. like hers got like eight or nine thousand um, listens, um, and then downloads. Wow. Yeah, so it's it's definitely growing. I've only been doing this for about a year, um, cool. but definitely heard in I think over two hundred and twenty five different countries around the the world. So wow, yeah. So it's it's definitely been a fun experience, and you know, like I said. And, and the message is, you, you know, I am a high school principal here in Farmington, so mm -hmm. I kind of do this. Yeah. So I, I looked at your profile when you when you messaged me, and I saw that, and I didn't realize that you were the the first pick for Joe's running mate here in Chinle. Yes, I was. Uh, my wife and I uh, we went down to Chinle, uh, I think, two weekends ago to meet with him and his wife. Mm. So it was definitely um, a, 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 an accomplishment, and you know I was excited to represent schools yeah. and in the educational community. Um, but that's definitely maybe down the road we'll we'll explore that option some more. 
<laughs> yeah, I so, thought that was a great move just because education needs to be the priority out here right now, you know, bringing the communities together like you talked about with the stakeholders. It's, man, that would have been great to see. You, you'd have had my vote for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we'll see maybe down the road. Um, uh, but, but I think, uh, you know, I think what you're doing is absolutely powerful with the running and, and the events. And I like the way you tie um, your hobbies with uh, education. Uh, my wife and I are, you know, my wife is a, a associate professor here at San Juan College, and we're pretty active. We run a bunch, and you know, we go to, we do to, we do, I think, four to five uh, half marathons um, each year. Um, we did actually the Warrior Run a couple years, and and you did the the full marathon, and we mm. just did the half. So you were still out. Otherwise, I'd have come up and said hi to you, but you were out, <laughs> out running still. <laughs> Right on. That works. So, absolutely. So next time I see you, I'll definitely uh, stop by and um, you know stop you and say hi to you and and talk with you. We can chat or and catch up. And if you're ever in Farmington, you know, let me know. Maybe we can get coffee and talk about cool. talk about uh, administration or something. <laughs> <laughs> Release a little bit. <laughs> absolutely. Well, I appreciate it, Sean. Um, I'll I'll let you know whenever the uh, podcast is ready to go. Okay. Sounds good. Hey, thanks a bunch. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. We'll talk to you later. Have a good evening. All right, bye. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Again, take a look at Northern Edge Casino for their upcoming concert with Tracy Lawrence. Tickets can be purchased for general admission for $25 and $35 for VIP. Thank you and have a good day. 